So we're going to look at a graphic now that says some of the tasks that take place or phases that take place over time. So first, you come up with an idea. This idea might be, we looked at some examples earlier, but it might be, what is the next generation of this thing? What is what is a new feature that we can add? Or like, what, where are some problems that we can solve for our users, right? Um, so you can go ahead and pause here because I know that there's a lot of words if you need to read them all. But the idea generation just basically says, look, I've got a team of people, I've got a team of developers, I've got a team of designers. What's the next thing that they should be focusing on? And then once we have the idea, once we kind of know that this is a good place for us to spend our money developing and researching, then we start to design it. And of course, the designers work uh, closely with the developers to make sure that the thing that's implemented was the thing that was intended to be designed and that it works as intended, etc. Um, now, you'll notice that validate is in here a couple of times already. So validate just meaning that you stop, you have regular checkpoints, and you constantly ask yourself, is this the right thing? Is this thing at the end of the day going to either save money or make money? And we'll talk a little bit later about how uh, new ideas can save and make money, but just know that that's what we mean by validate, right? We're, we're just kind of checking ourselves regularly, consistently and saying, are we on the right track still? Do we need to backpedal? And then you implement it, right? So you've got this, this, this thing, right? You've got this idea and it could be uh, a new uh, phase of a website. It could be, um, it, could, it could be a new application. It could be the next new smartphone, right? Or the thing that exists after smartphones. We don't know what that is yet. Um, but you have to implement it, which is you, you build it, you sell it, you get people onboarded with it. You, um, you help people understand how to use it. You support them. So this is where like, you know, if you think of like call centers that are helping with support, um, this is especially where like a technical communicator might come into play because they're having to not only document what exists from the developers, but also they're working with readers and with users to understand how to use something. So several overlapping pla phases take place. So there's not necessarily like phase one, phase two, phase three. Um, it's a little bit more nuanced and gray than that. Um, a lot of people work together in these types of things. So idea generation, again, there's roles involved there, um, like business and product, design and development. These are the types of people that start to kind of figure out the details of the problem and start to come up with um, some of the more uh, finite or granular uh, uh, aspects of the thing that you're trying to create. And then you implement it. And it, this is where people sort of figure out where will people need help? Where can we make this transition easier, etc. cetera. Um, now, this might look linear, right? This might look like it starts at idea generation and it flows even, even, even until you get to the end of implementation. But that's not true. In fact, everything is kind of circling back. Again, part of that validation process is you, you check back, you circle back, and you have regular meetups with all of these different types of people that work together. Take a moment to note down any product or, I'm sorry, any roles that you maybe aren't aware what they mean and ask your instructor or start a discussion that says, well, what is a customer rep? What is a QA person? What is a, you know, a technical support person? These are types of roles that are involved in the process of creating the next big thing that could be really good fit for uh, for what you're wanting to major in. There's lots of design thinking, you know, processes or frameworks, yada yada, but a lot of them look the same. And notice here, take a moment, you can pause if you wish, but notice how as we move forward from left to right, there's all these arrows that kind of circle us backward. They kind of bring us back and they have us almost loop backwards to say, hey, am, am I I'm validating with you. Is this the right thing? Is this what you had intended? For example, business has an idea that's going to drive sales 10%. Designers, before they get too far and hand something off to developers, they need to say, hey, businessman, is this what you had in mind? Um, so that's what we mean by validate. Validate just kind of means checking your work as you go before, you, before you've gone so far that it's going to take a lot of money to redo the work that wasn't right. All of this really started um, from the design, um, the Stanford Institute of Design 
um, and they had a little bit more of a linear process and so again this was the first one and more in, like institutions and organizations that have built upon this now do include this sort of double back uh, um, type of metaphor. You'll also see that this is something called the double diamond process. So the double diamond, um, even though this looks very much like a diamond, this also looks kind of like the two diamonds, right? They're circular, but you can kind of see how they've got these shapes where you expand, you expand, you take a lot of ideas, you crunch, you crunch, you, you come into the middle, you narrow down on those ideas, and then you expand again to think about how the ideas, uh, think about the details of the ideas, broaden out the ideas that you narrowed down on, and then you eventually cramp, you know, you cinch down in again to the middle to, um, to work on what is the final thing. Um, Nielsen Norman Group is a famous user experience uh, research institution and they're highly renowned and they're, uh, they're, they have a website nngroup.com that you can visit if you wish. Um, they also have a, a quite nice graphic that illustrates um, essentially the same thing. So all of these graphics and if you would like to pause the video and, and go back uh, uh, you know, and look at the different ones, there are lots of similarities among them even if they look slightly different because what they're saying is as you go forward, you come back. You take almost like three steps forward, one step backward. You just double check because even though that does take more time to take that step backward, in the end, it saves more time, um, it saves more money. And we'll look at some graphics in a little bit that explain that. And here's another uh, UX practitioner's uh, guide to the double diamond and, and what it means. And there are some phrases in here, like you see HMW question, that stands for how might we, um, so you may see some some terms throughout some of these graphics that you don't maybe understand yet. Um, but what the double diamond approach and what design thinking allows you to do is fail fast. You might be saying like, well, failure is a bad thing, right? But actually, that's not true. Failure is actually a really, really good thing, so long as it's done the right way. And the way it's done the right way is by failing fast. So again, notice there's kind of these double diamond sort of approaches, these peaks here, right? Where you scramble, scramble, you do a lot of work, you come back, you meet in the middle, you do a lot more work, you come back and meet in the middle. Plan, th these are the people that are like the business, strategy, UX research, UX design, things like that. Build, this relies a lot on the developers on the team that actually make the product real. And then after, you know, this deadline, after the product is finished, this, doesn't this deadline doesn't necessarily mean that's when users are getting it in their hands, but it means that's our deadline for stopping the development work so that people like technical communicators can document it, um, so that salespeople can sell it, things like that. Um, but notice that we can have a lot of failure and chaos so long as it's controlled because what we don't want is to fail here. As the timeline goes on, the risk for failure grows higher and higher because if I fail here, this means I have to redo all of this work that was ramping up and taking up more and more time, taking up more and more resources and developers, right? If I fail here, notice that nothing really has been done at this point. If I fail in the early on stages of plan, then you know you have more time to adapt. The other thing as well is the earlier are you on you are the farther away you are from that deadline. The closer you are to the deadline, of course you just don't have as much time, no matter, I mean, let alone the fact that you are having to redo potentially weeks or months of work, but you also just don't have much time to make the changes. So that's what we mean by failing fast. Failing fast is good, um, but in, in design thinking has several frameworks that, that exist that are out there that different types of frameworks, which are just those different images that I went through previously, different ones tend to work better just for different companies because of the culture or the types of things that they build. Um, but overall, that's what design thinking allows you to do. So failing fast, again, it, it's a lot of little experiments, um, but but hopefully one of them will, will, will grow or some of them will grow. And what's great is, you know, ideas are not bad. Even bad ideas are not bad. As long as we find out early on that it is a bad idea, we can scrap it. But everyone that makes these products, everyone that's involved, they all have bad ideas. But so long as we can identify, and if, when I say bad, that doesn't mean that it's because that person isn't good at their job or, you know, because they can't think of good ideas. All it really means is that 
this idea in the long run isn't going to make us more money than it's going to take to build it. That's really all we mean by quote unquote a bad idea um, in this case. And that all not all ideas are worth spending time or money on. Um, and that's okay. It's good for us to think about all the different types of ideas that we can. Um, when we do go through these design thinking exercises, what we get is feedback. We get feedback from so many people that, you know, feedback is a little bit hard to take at first, especially those that are maybe a little bit more junior in their career. They may think of feedback as criticism or you're telling me I'm not doing a good job or I'm, you know, you're giving me all these things that I did wrong, which on one hand, that is kind of true. But it's not because you're doing a bad job. It's not because, you know, you aren't good at your job. It just means that there was something that you didn't know that maybe someone else knew a little bit better. And they're able to help you elevate the thing that it is that you're working on. Design thinking also happens to be really, really good for business. Go ahead and watch this video on YouTube on design thinking. It's called Transforming Healthcare for Children and Their Families. Um, by Doug Deet, and it was given at a TEDx in San Jose. Um, take a minute to watch that and then come back to this video and we'll discuss. Okay, so how did Doug and his team apply design thinking, aka thinking like a designer, to solve some of their problems? By using design thinking, they were better able to fit the needs of their primary users, who were the children, and simply add a cosmetic layer to this extremely robust, expensive MRI technology, which ended up saving their business, aka the hospital, a ton of time and money in the end. They're saving money because technicians aren't having to spend as long with each patient. They're able to get more appointments in a day. They're having fewer cancellations. Um, they're spending less money on sedations and other you maybe calming techniques. Um, and of course, this is not only good for the user, right? The user's well-being is drastically improved because this experience is not traumatic. It's actually a little bit exciting. But again, the technician is not having to do parts of their job that they really dread and, and do not look forward to doing. Instead, they get to be reminded of why they entered healthcare, which is to help children and to help people and to make people better. Um, and again, I mean, from the bottom line perspective, the business is greatly improved. It does make a financial impact. You can see here some of these top companies that are using design thinking um, to have a significant impact on their bottom line because they have 74% above average earnings, 70% uh, above average return to their investors, and they're also growing at about 67% above the average. It doesn't just increase sales though. Um, 15% of IT projects are abandoned. And this number comes partially because if you think back to the graphic I showed you about failing fast, again, if you fail early on, which, which is what failing fast means, it's okay and you haven't really even potentially gotten the developers involved at that point. Um, but either way, you don't have a ton of work put into it. You're not really risking that much if you fail early on. But when you fail late in the game, that's when it may not be worth it to just to even try to save this IT project or this whatever the project might be but it might just be better to say screw it and we're going to abandon it all together because it would take too much time too much money to go back not only redo our work but try to redo everything we've done and get it done by the deadline it just may be impossible additionally 50 percent of a programmer's time could be wasted on doing some of that rework we can look at some calculations that say when things are designed right the first time, when we fail fast and not later on, and when we employ design thinking to make sure that we're building the right thing from the start, we can see a lot of ways that this saves money. So errors, you can think of this as like maybe a bug in an application or like a defect. Um, when we have an error, we have to ask a developer to fix it. And we have to think about how much money a developer makes and how many developers might be tasked with fixing errors or defects at any given time. And if we kind of stick some realistic data in there, we can see that that could be about $300,000 a year spent just on fixing errors. Now, errors are not completely avoidable, but when we use design thinking, when we get that fail fast mentality, we're not crunching up till the deadline. We're not redoing a bunch of work in a hurried pace. We're going to always reduce the number of errors that are in our application. 
thinking about the cost of development and maintenance. Again, thinking about if something is fixed early or if it's changed late. You can go ahead and pause this here if you want to take a better look, but you can see that's exact proof of why fail fast is the right methodology to use when developing products. Productivity as well, thinking about, you know, if, if employees are able to use a tool, they're not having to constantly search through the help documentation, they're not having to call the help desk, they're not having to file support tickets, things like that. When we say that design thinking saves money, in a lot of ways what we're just talking about is not having valuable people who get paid a good amount of money spending time on things that really shouldn't be an issue at all if the product was designed correctly the first time. Um, so that's an example of how design thinking saves money, but it also makes money. Think about Airbnb. So if you're not familiar, it's just, it's a place, it's kind of like um, booking a real person's house to stay at instead of staying at a hotel. Now when design, or when Airbnb first got started, um, they weren't noticing some of the profits that they're a little bit more used to seeing now. And they did some user research and they, they tried to understand from the users, well, why aren't you booking here? Why are you choosing to go somewhere else? And the solution that they found to solve this problem was so simple and so cheap, it's almost mind boggling. The only thing that they needed to have their, their um, renters do, the people that are renting out their property, is simply to upload better photos of their property. So take a look here. These are like not the best photos. They're a little bit, you know, the lighting isn't great. They're maybe not in focus. Um, and take a look at what happens when you just tell people how to take good pictures of their space, how to do some, some light uh, modification of the setting and the lighting. Look at what a difference that makes and how much more would you be willing to spend at the place on the right than at the place on the left even though it's the exact same place. And again, thinking about what these places can look like if you just give your renters a little bit of information. And what they've actually done is now they have a space on their website that says showcase your space. Um, and they have actually have some numbers there that say that there's a 40% increase in earnings, meaning people are willing to spend more, um, people are willing to book there more, and that you can charge more per night. Um, so we've gone through a few examples of how design thinking, not only does it create better products by, for example, in this Airbnb example, giving people what they want and solving the needs that they maybe didn't even realize they had, but it allows us to ask the right question by talking to our users, whether that's little children that need to have an MRI machine scan, whether that's um, people that want to experience flowers, whether it's people that want to use ketchup. These are all examples of getting to the bottom of what the user needs um, and how we can solve those problems and not just draw a vase over and over again. And I wanna leave you with one final, one final example of, of why design thinking is really just the only way to develop products um, and be competitive in today's age. Um, so again, think about if I asked you uh, in two minutes, maybe not even two minutes, in 30 seconds if I said, how many ways would you describe the sky, the color of the sky? If I gave you 30 seconds, everyone would have a lot of the same answers. Blue, black, gray. But what if I said, take five minutes to write down all the colors of the sky. Think about what the possibilities might be. Tangerine, aqua, navy. That's just an example of saying, when we get more people involved and we let them have more time to plan, we'll start to come up with the ideas that no one else is coming up with. But if everyone takes 30 seconds to name the colors of the sky, everyone's gonna create blue skies, black skies, right? These are the, This is an example of how when companies try to just do the same thing everyone else is doing, we end up with a bunch of the same products and none that differentiate from one another. So that's been our presentation on design thinking. Thank you for watching.